Watch TLDR ad-free, get exclusive videos, and soon the daily briefing by signing up to Nebula for just $15 a year. And the Curiosity Stream Nebula bundle deal is linked in the description. A few weeks ago, we did a video on why the Russian economy was collapsing. Because, at the time, things looked pretty bad for Putin. Thanks to unprecedented Western sanctions, the ruble being down 60%, and various private companies voluntarily pulling out of Russia. However, in the last week or so, the prospects for the Russian economy have improved significantly. The ruble has recovered, and multilateral sanctions on Russian energy exports, which are currently bankrolling Putin's invasion, look unlikely. So in this video, we're going to try and do our best to explain how the Russian economy recovered, whether the ruble will continue to rise, and what the West can do about it. Before we get into the video, a quick disclaimer. The unprecedented sanctions imposed on Russia by the West and Putin's unprecedented response has taken us into uncharted territory. So economists are still struggling to understand exactly what this means for the global economy. And well, we're not economists, so don't take our word as gospel here. That being said, even if this video isn't quite perfect, we still thought this was an interesting and important topic, so we wanted to go ahead with it. Disclaimers aside, let's get into it. When sanctions were first introduced in late February, many analysts expected them to cripple the Russian economy. After all, these sanctions were unprecedented. They included freezing Russian central bank assets, expelling Russian banks from SWIFT, and individual sanctions on Russian elites and Putin himself. In fact, in the first few weeks, Russia's economy looked precariously close to collapse, and the ruble did collapse to an all-time low of 140 per dollar. And as such, the Russian central bank was forced to more than double interest rates, with Russia also closing their stock exchange indefinitely. However, in the past week or so, the Russian economy has recovered somewhat. The ruble's value has recovered against the dollar by about 45% and is now trading at about 90 ruble per dollar. And when Russia finally reopened their stock exchange on March 24th for a shortened trading session, Russian stocks did surprisingly well. 33 out of the 50 stocks which make up the Russian equity benchmark were available. And well, they all did surprisingly well, with the 33 stock index up 11% on the first day. Now, this stock market rally should be taken with a massive pinch of salt. This 11% jump only amounts to a partial recovery from the 50% drop that Russian stocks have suffered since December. And the rise was driven by Russian oil companies, with shares in gas giant Gazprom jumping around 20% and other oil majors up by 19%. This was sort of to be expected though. As you probably know, energy companies are currently exempt from sanctions, so you'd expect their shares to rise given the oil and gas prices are higher than average, and higher than when the market's closed. In fact, Brent crude is trading at about $110 per barrel at the moment, which is about twice the average price for 2020 and 21. And the Dutch TTF futures, the benchmark for European natural gas, are at about 100 euros per megawatt hour, about four times their previous average. So Russia's rebound was clearly helped by energy companies which have been boosted by the global market. Russia's stock rises were probably also helped by the fact that short selling was banned and foreign investors were unable to exit their positions during trade, which is why the US accused Russia of artificially pushing up Russian shares. But even if the stock market can be explained away, how come the ruble has recovered so well? Well, the interest rate hike from 9.5 to 20% probably helped, as did the fact that Russia has literally banned foreign investors from selling their Russian investments. But perhaps the single most important factor in the ruble's recovery has been energy revenues. Originally, Putin required all Russian exporters to convert 80% of their foreign exchange reserves into the ruble. Essentially, this means that any Russian company exporting goods like oil, gas, or coal has to use 80% of the money they get to buy more rubles. This increases demand for, and therefore the value of, the ruble. And given that Europe were buying somewhere between 700 million 
and a billion dollars worth of Russian energy exports every day, late February and early March. This means that some 560 to 800 million dollars worth of foreign currency was being used every single day to prop up the ruble. But it doesn't stop there, and Putin has taken it a step further, with quote, unfriendly countries, i.e. basically all of Europe, being told that if they want to buy Russian gas, they'll have to pay for it in rubles. Now, at first glance, this seems counterintuitive. You might reasonably think that given that most of Putin's foreign exchange reserves have been frozen, and the ruble's economic collapse, that he'd want foreign currency more than he wants the ruble. But there are a couple of reasons why Putin might have decided to do this. For starters, it effectively means that not just 80%, but 100% of Russian foreign currency inflows for gas are now being spent to prop up the ruble. Secondly, even if Russia was receiving dollars and euros for its gas, sanctions meant that Russia would have had to use complicated and inefficient systems of intermediary banks to actually use that currency. By telling European countries that they have to pay in rubles, Putin essentially outsourced this process to his unfriendly neighbours. So, European countries now need to somehow get their hands on rubles, even though their sanctions prohibit trade with most Russian banks. Which brings us on to the third reason for Putin requiring rubles. It discourages further European sanctions. Because, well, the Europeans need Russian banks to give them rubles if they then want to be able to buy Russian gas. Somewhat predictably though, European companies have come out and said that they won't do this. And to be fair to them, Putin's request would most likely constitute a breach of their contract. That's because most of the long-term gas contracts between Gazprom and European energy companies are denominated in either euros or dollars, not rubles. Ultimately though, the legality here is sort of irrelevant. Putin has said that if he's not paid in rubles, Russia will turn off the gas taps on March 31st. So what happens next? Well, it looks unlikely that Western countries will give in and agree to pay in rubles, because, well, doing so would be an embarrassing humiliation. It is possible that Putin's bluffing about turning off the taps. After all, that would mean losing out on the equivalent of about $400 million worth of gas sales every day. That being said though, there are signs that Putin is preparing for this sort of thing. On Friday, the Russian central bank announced that it would be buying gold for 5,000 rubles per gram from commercial Russian banks, which would mean more gold to compensate fewer gas sales. It's worth saying that gold is currently trading for about 6,000 rubles per gram, but some Russian banks might be willing to pay a premium if they're struggling for liquidity. Ultimately, what happens next depends on whether or not the West decides it can live without Russian gas. We actually did a video on this over on TLDR Global, so go and take a look at that if you want to know more. But the TLDR of that is, while it wouldn't be easy for Europe, it wouldn't be catastrophic to cut off Russian gas either. And speaking of TLDR, if you do want more from us, you ought to check out Nebula, the streaming service my creator friends and I teamed up to build, where you can watch all of TLDR's videos ad-free and get a bunch of exclusive content which will never make it to YouTube. Also, next week we're bringing back our show. The also, next week we're bringing back our show, The Daily Briefing. And while an abridged version will be available on YouTube, the full briefing is only on Nebula. It's not just us either. All of your favorite educational creators are already there, like Wendover Productions, Real Life Law, Polymatter, Legal Eagle, Half as Interesting, and many more. But wait, we said this video was brought to you by Curiosity Stream, right? Well, as a platform full of the best documentaries online, they naturally love educational creators like us. As such, we worked out a deal whereby if you sign up to Curiosity Stream using the link in the description, you'll also get free access to Nebula. And that's not a free trial either. You'll get access as long as you're a member. To make things even better, for a limited time, they're offering a deal where you can get 26% off their already low price, making an entire year of both services less than $15. Less than $15 a year for all of your favorite educational creators, as well as superb documentaries on CuriosityStream. Signing up at curiositystream.com forward slash TLDR global or clicking the link below not only gets you the deal but also directly supports TLDR and educational content on the platform more generally.
as well as getting you original content and an ad-free experience.